Good evening, this is Harvey Ambrose, and I'm a guest minister on the Wells of Salvation radio ministry, preaching tonight to Grace Baptist Mission in Soldana, Alaska. Continuing in our study of the Gospel according to Mark, we are in chapter 16, and we'll begin the reading in verse 1. And when the Sabbath, and I'm having trouble reading, I don't have the right light here, and when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun, and they said among themselves, Who shall roll away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away. For it was very great. And entering into the sepulchre, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. And he said unto them, Be not affrighted. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He's not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way. Tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him, as he said unto you. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulchre, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any, for they were afraid. Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that had been with him, as they mourned and wept. And they, when they had heard that he was alive, and had been seen of her, believed not. After that he appeared in another form unto two of them, and they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it unto the residue. Neither believed they them. Afterward he appeared unto the eleven, as they sat at meat, and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he had risen. And I'll start stop the reading there and try to talk about that and hopefully conclude uh, the chapter before the time is up. And I'm going to try to keep it on track if I can. So here we have the conclusion of the Gospel according to Mark. There's going to be a commission he's going to talk about and what promises he makes. And then he ascends and that's where he is today. So I want us to notice that it begins with the discussion of the Sabbath having been passed. So this is this is Sunday, but it relates an event that happened uh, that happened what we would call Saturday night. The Jewish day started at around 6 p.m. of what we would call Saturday. You know that well. I mean, every day was that way, but at 6 p.m. So, so their Sabbath would begin, you know, which was a Saturday, would begin Friday evening at six and conclude Saturday evening at six. So it says that they had gone, uh, let's see, and that they had, let's see. So when it was passed, these three women went and bought spices. They could not have done that on the Sabbath. It was illegal under Jewish law. It was illegal to sell it. It was illegal to buy it. It was illegal to engage in any such business. So they waited till 6 o'clock Saturday and went to a market. And there was a famous market there in Jerusalem which had all manner of spice and, and all types of things that people want. And, uh, and they had bought these things for the Lord because they were sad that he was taken from them. They perhaps, it said many women had seen what happened at the cross from afar off. They were no doubt grieving in their hearts. In their minds there was nothing they could do for him. He was dead. They had seen before where they had laid him. But they were coming back now that the Sabbath was over with spices to anoint him 
his body because they loved him. Now, there has never been a Sabbath like the one spoken of, past tense here in verse 1 of chapter 16, since the very first Sabbath that God instituted in this world. No doubt about it. And the connection between that first Sabbath, which happened upon the seventh day of the first week, so the very seventh day uh, since time began to be uh, reckoned, starting with the first day, going through the sixth, and on the sixth he had created mankind, and having completed all of his work, we read in Genesis, he rest, on the sixth day was the completion of that work, and so God rested from his labors on the Sabbath, and or on the seventh day, which is called the Sabbath, a day of rest. It had been codified in the Jewish law when God gave the law to Moses, and it had become very strictly kept, too much so, by the Pharisees of Jesus' time. But I want us to notice the <laughs> the synergy between these two Sabbaths because Jesus having spent his life working for the salvation of men he came into this world that we might be saved and he did all things towards that end there wasn't anything he did while he walked this world that was not towards that and particularly during his ministry every word and action thought and deed it was centered on reaching that Friday that he was crucified. And he labored, as it were, one hour on the cross for each day of creation up until the Sabbath. So for six hours he hung on a cross, and for six days this very same man, Jesus, created the heavens and the earth. Remember? It says in the Gospel according to John that uh, you know, the Word was with God, the Word was God, all things were created by Him, and, and all things were made by Him, and there was nothing, and nothing was made that was made, well, let me read it, it's been too long since I've studied John. I ain't messing that kind of stuff up. It begins with in the beginning, just like Genesis does. Think of that. Is that coincidence? In the beginning was the Word. This is Christ before He was made flesh. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So He created all things. Where we sit right now, He created it. Everything that has sustained mankind, He created it. Everything that has sustained plant life and animal life, and, and everything that has caused celestial things to occur as they do with such regular precision. He, he created all that. He, he did all that in six days. <laughs> and he rested on the seventh. Similarly, the Lord Jesus did all that was needed to do since he was born under the law. He was subject to the law. He made himself subject to his own law. He did not have to. As God, he could, he's free to do as he chooses, but he chose to make himself subject to the law, being born under the law, and he had to keep every jot and tittle. There was not a single thing that he was supposed to do that he did not do, and nor did he ever do anything that the law forbade him to do, despite people claiming otherwise. He has indeed been busy and it seems as though his busyness reached a fever pitch there at the end because it was at that sixth day, if you will, of that week where his real mission, which was to bear the sins of the people of this world, had been inaugurated that evening that, well, as it would be called, it would have been Thursday night as we would see it, but it was Friday morning, or it was Friday, it was the evening of the sixth day, according to the Jews, that he was in Gethsemane. And the sins of the world were laid upon him by the Father. 
And he drank that cup, even though he prayed that it would pass. But he submitted himself to the will of the Father. And, and all that sin coming upon him, it says he was made sin for us. He was, he was changed into sin. He that knew no sin, he became sin for us. That was punishment enough. Something that none of us could have borne. And yet he bore it through, as we read, four different jurisdictional courts. They were each and every one of them a sham. The closest to being legitimate was the one under Pilate, under Roman law. But even in that, though Pilate found no fault in him, yet he did not release him, but he put him to death because he was afraid of the people of this world. Jesus, having done that, he withstood all the punishment that men could give to him as they beat him and mocked him and slapped him, spat on him, nailed him to a cross, put a crown of thorns on his head, lifted him up above the earth. And that's important because he had said, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. And in so much that he was lifted up, the cross has appropriately become a symbol to which the world should look to be drawn to God. Because there's only one way to God, and that's through the man, Jesus Christ, who speaking of himself said, I am the way, meaning the way to God. I am the truth, the truth of God, the, the full truth and all of it, and the life, meaning life everlasting, no man cometh to the Father but by me. And how did he go to the Father? Well, he died to this world. He rose again on the third day. And before too many days had passed, he bodily ascended into the right hand of the Father and sat there from thenceforth expecting until his enemies become his footstool. So those who would presume... And there's many that do nowadays in this modern world of, of sketchy Bible reading and theological assumption, if you can call it that, try to make him having died on a Thursday, a Wednesday. I've heard people claim it was a Tuesday. But if we just read Mark, just the, the, the paragraph that went really just right before chapter 16, it says... Uh, in verse 42, this is speaking of Friday. It says, and now when the even was come, because it was the preparation. So the even that they're talking about, the, even, the, the evening where Jesus was crucified, it was the preparation. And then it says that is the day before the Sabbath. The Sabbath is Saturday. I know that there were high Sabbaths so, you know, concerning uh, the, the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, but that word, the preparation, always meant Friday. To Jews then and to Jews today, it is Friday. They prepared for other feasts, but the preparation was Friday. And that's what he's saying. Because it was the preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath. So Jesus was crucified on the preparation for Sabbath, which was Friday. <laughs> they, you know, they may have got a lot of things wrong in the tradition of the church, but they got that right. He was crucified on Friday, the sixth day, after having completed all his work. Remember what was his last word on the cross? One of them was, it is finished. All that was done. And so all Sabbath day, his body lay in the grave, quiet and still, and it rest. The disciples, no doubt they were mourning and weeping all that Sabbath. It was not joyful or restful to them. Even though he had told them this would happen, they never had ears to hear it. They didn't believe it. <laughs> when all these people saw him, when Mary came and said, I saw him. When the, the people, it talks about the disciples that he had walked with, it's talking about those who were in Luke are called on the way to Emmaus, the two disciples that he spoke with and then revealed himself to. 
They went and told the apostles. They didn't believe them. And he just, it, the apostles just ever once, during the, at least the four times where it's recorded, where Jesus said, I'm going to go up to, Crucif uh, up to Jerusalem. I'm going to be treated badly by people. I'm going to be crucified. And on the third day, I will rise from the dead. Had they just listened and believed, there would be no surprise. They would have been sitting around Saturday saying, boy, I can't hardly wait till tomorrow. Because he said he would rise the third day. They would have been having a celebration, thinking, yes, that was really rough what he went through, but he prophesied of it, and he also said he's going to raise on the third day. We're going to see him again tomorrow. But they didn't. They didn't, the saying just somehow escaped them. They could not, they could not grasp it. And when Jesus does see them, finally in that upper room, he upbraids them because of their lack of faith and because of the hardness of their hearts. And how many times have I tried to explain what I think the Bible means when it talks about being hard-hearted? When it's talking about the heart, it's not talking about the organ that pumps blood. It's talking about the inner person. That, that the, if you will, the soul or the, the spirit within man. That which makes you, you. That which God looks upon. God looks on the heart. He deals with the heart. It's not, it's not like he's unaware of what the flesh does, but he judges based upon the thoughts and the intents of human hearts. Because the flesh does not always do what the heart wants. He, he judges the heart. And I lost track of where I was. But uh, anyway, oh, their hearts were hardened. And what I think that means is that when we try to confine and somehow limit God's works to something that is rational to us, something that makes sense to what we see every day, then we get just like those disciples. And we don't think for a minute that he's going to rise from the dead. Now looking back and with the Bible to explain it all, we, we believe it. But when we're talking about the second coming, people are already beginning to doubt that that's going to happen. They don't really know what it means. They can't truly believe that when he comes back, he's going to judge the whole world. They can't for a moment believe that those who have done wicked will be raised into a resurrection of damnation and be eternally punished and cursed with no with no possibility of parole, it, it just, it's just too cruel. Their, their heart is hard to the workings of God. We are way too attuned to how this world works, and we, we just don't quite believe the revelation of God concerning Himself, His actions, His thoughts, and His foretelling of what will happen, which I won't call it predictions. Predictions are subject to fail. But what he prophesies, it always comes to pass. These guys should have thought about that. So here we have the comparison between the first six days and culminating the sixth day of work and beginning the Sabbath of rest. Now he has spent his life in the last six hours is, is dying on a cross, which is why he came to that hour, it says. He says of himself, that's why I came to this hour, is to die. Now he has a rest. He rests all day. <laughs> That's probably the longest rest he's ever had. <laughs> now his body's resting. It's dead as a doornail. But even the body has not rested for our Lord. He was a working man. Some of you who work, and I used to do a little bit of it, not much, <laughs> but I tried, or I made other people work. Anyway, working people understand the rest that comes from a hard day physical labor. So did Jesus, because he was such a man. Well, after laboring for our salvation, he rested from it, having accomplished all. And it was finished. He breathed out his last. He committed his spirit to God, and they took him, and they put him in a tomb, borrowed, as it were, for just a couple of days. And then he, uh, he rose. And with that rising in a different body than he had. We don't know exactly how different. It, it, it gives hints, but there's, 
No doubt that not even the smallest fragment of what that means, being raised a spiritual body. See, the Bible teaches us spirit and flesh as though those are two distinct things, which they certainly are as we are now framed, as each and every one of us has a spirit, and we each have flesh, and the, the two together form the soul or the self of man. But the, what God judges is the heart, which I take to mean kind of the, the spirit within man. But here he rose from the dead, a new form of human. Now that's important. And, and maybe I'll get to that in a little bit. I'm taking too long. We'll move on. So uh, these women either forgot to take a man with them, big enough to roll away the stone, or the men would not come <clears throat> because they, they had no interest in going back there. So here they are worrying and talking about who's going to remove the stone, and we read because it was really large. Well, they knew nothing about the fact that the high priest had come to Caiaphas and demanded that a guard be set there, and it was a Roman guard, which would have stopped them from getting anywhere near it because the, the whole thing that the priest said was that the disciples were going to steal the body. So here come these women, like they're really going to steal a body. And, uh, but see, uh, they never knew about that at the time because the Roman guard fled when Christ raised from the dead, when the angel came and they were terrified of that and, and they were like dead men, it said. And I'm sure they absconded pretty quick. The Lord came out. No one saw him coming out. But Mary saw him, it says, first, here in our text. Mary Magdalene. She was with the other two women, but she had hurried, you have to read other gospels. She had preceded them getting to the crawl or getting to the tomb. She was mortified that he was not in there. She she began to ask where, you know, where is uh well actually an angel talked to him, I think. I'm not sure. Uh, but in any case, she wanted to know where his body was. She saw someone. Obviously, the Lord made himself appear to be the gardener because she said she assumed he was the gardener. And, you know, he says, where have they taken him? You know, if you know where it is, tell me so I can come and get him. And then, of course, he spoke to her. So he spoke to Mary. He revealed his risen body a new order of humanity, not like what we are, but it is what we will be. Whatever he was when he rose, that's what we will be when he raises us on the last day in the resurrection. So, <clears throat> if I can get my thoughts on this again. For some reason, the Lord revealed himself first to Mary Magdalene not the apostles. They were the last of the closest group to whom he revealed himself. It was other people first. Maybe that was to teach the apostles that they should have listened. We don't know why it was. But we do know that Jesus said that there are last that shall be first. And there are first that shall be last. He did, deny the first, he did not deny the firstness or the lastness of it. He just says that how we see things first on this world is not necessarily how God sees first. Mary Magdalene we read in this same chapter, verse 9, Jesus had cast seven devils out of that woman. Seven devils found themselves pleased to dwell within her. What kind of a state was she in? What kind of a person was she? We know about the man that had the legion. He was completely insane and possessed of superhuman strength, and yet he was desperately unhappy crying all night long, cutting himself with stones, living amongst tombs and dead people, hated, by, hated and feared by all of his neighbors. Maybe she was such a one as that. In any case, Jesus, it does not say when he did it, had cast out seven devils from her. And from that point on, Mary Magdalene loved him with all her heart, to whom much is forgiven, the same loveth much, is what Jesus told uh, Simon when he feasted at his house and the sinner woman came with a box of ointment. 
And maybe that's because her heart of all the disciples was so in love with Christ that he saw to it that she was the one who first saw the risen Lord. Okay, I'll go back to the text in verse 5. It says they entered into the sepulcher and they saw a young man. Now we know it was an angel. He was in a long robe. He had knowledge that no men would have. And he tells her, you know, it says, uh, he says, he was crucified. I wonder what was going on in the angel's mind when he's confessing the fact that God was crucified. He's like, I mean, you know, what, what was the sound? What was the inflection? It, he was crucified. <laughs> he's shocked at these things. He, and well, he ought to be. Jesus made him. He had been around for at least 4,000 years. Longer, if you read the Septuagint, 5,500 years. And maybe longer because the angels might have come before the heavens and the earth. Because they were there, it says, and shouted when Jesus laid the foundations of the earth. When he formed the earth, it says, the morning stars sang together, and the sons of God, that's the angels, shouted for joy. This angel had shouted for joy probably more than 5,500 years ago, but when they see him, he's a young man. <laughs> see, they don't age. There's no sin. There's no penalty for sin. There's no reason for them to age. I think when we're raised, we'll be raised at just the right appearance, and beauty that God would have us had had it not been for sin, and we shall ever be that way. There will be no aging to us, nothing to disfigure, nothing to defile the body that God right raises from the dead. And when he says he was crucified, and he's risen, you know, Jesus, well, we'll go on. He was amazed at it. I'm not sure that they understood it, but the fact that he was risen, he confirmed that by saying, well, he's not here. Behold the place where they laid him. So look for yourselves, is what we would say. Satisfy your, he's not here. He is risen. And he also gave her, or gave these women instructions to go to the disciples and Peter. I don't know why he would separate Peter, but chances are that Peter is the most grieving one of them. He had as Jesus had prophesied, only hours before, he had denied him three times in the space of hours. It's the last one, cursing as he did so, totally denying the Lord. Not as bad as what Judas did, but Judas isn't here, and nor is he repenting. He's already taken his own life. But Peter is no doubt in deep inner turmoil on this Sunday morning. So the angel, no doubt, given instructions by God, is saying, go and tell the disciples that he's risen. And he goes on and says that he's, uh, he's going to go on, see if I can find it. He's going before you, going in front of you, to Galilee. There shall you see him. He had told them that after he's risen, he's going to go to Galilee. And that does happen, but it doesn't happen immediately. But they mentioned Peter specifically. Because the Lord wanted to make sure that Peter was just not overwhelmed with sorrow for his, somehow or other, thinking his part in that because of the denial. Of course, if Peter confessed him, it wouldn't have changed the circumstances. It just would have changed him for Peter because he would have done all that he could. We should do all that we can. There's many things we can't do. There, you know, The Lord has to do all the important things. But what we can do we ought to do. And we ought to do it without fear of men. Yet there's still cowardice in us. But anyway, it says, uh, Behold the place where they laid him, so they looked. But I thought about a, a passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This guy is saying, He was crucified. And now he's risen. But in 1 Corinthians 15, we read how all the dead who are raised in the resurrection of life will be raised just like Christ was. And it describes how we will be raised. So that's the same as describing how Christ was raised. 
So I want you to, if you want to, you can follow me, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 42, it says, So also is the resurrection of the dead. So this would apply to Christ. He was sown in corruption. Not his own sin, but our sins had been laid upon him. And he was capable of death, but not any longer. He was sown in corruption, raised in glory. So the risen Christ came out of that tomb in glory. A glorified human body. It is sown in weakness, meaning the human body that dies. It is raised in power. Christ came out of that with all the power. No doubt. He already had the, all the power of heaven and earth given to him by his Father. But now that is still true of his risen flesh. And probably, oh, I can't say more. You can't get more than all. But he was raised in power, as will we be. We won't have all power, but we will be raised powerful. Powerful to do the bidding of God. That's all the power we need. If he gives us enough power to to live forever doing exactly what pleases Him, that's all the power any one of us needs. We don't have it now, do we? We, we are weakness itself when it comes to serving God, but we won't be that way forever. He was sown or planted, put in the grave, a natural body, just like what we all have today. It came from our parents, naturally, through procreation, what God had sent in the world on the sixth day. Of creation. It is so he was sown a natural body, but he was raised a spiritual body. Now that term is in here. We just don't know exactly what that means. But I think there is something to it when he appears to them in one place in the upper room after he raises and he says, Give me something to eat. He said, You know, spirits don't eat. I'm flesh and bone. Now, everywhere else in the Bible it speaks about the fleshly state as being flesh and blood. Flesh and blood. And, and there's a prohibition against drinking blood or eating blood or an animal that still has blood in it because it says because the blood is the life thereof. So God has conveyed through, through blood flowing through our system. It keeps us alive. You take blood out and you die. There's no doubt about that. And the blood gets the oxygen and all that good stuff. But the life of the body is the blood the Bible teaches us. But he's saying, he's, he doesn't mention his blood. He said, I'm flesh and bone. And it speaks of our life as being through the Spirit. When we're raised, the life that is ours will be the spiritual life that comes from God to us. And we are sustained physically by spiritual life coming from the giver of life, our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom is life. And he gave his life for the life of the world. So in a natural body raised a spiritual body. It says there is a natural body. We know that. And there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, The first man Adam, our ancestor in the flesh, was made a living soul. That's when God breathed in his nostrils the breath of life. The last Adam, speaking of Christ, was made a quickening or a life-giving spirit. And see, to everyone who comes to him in a full repentance and trust for help, calling upon him until he answers them with life, that quickening spirit engenders life into a dead heart, into a dead spirit, and we are said by Christ to pass from death unto life, even while we live in mortal, natural bodies down here. But the life is everlasting. So that after our bodies are gone, they'll be raised back up like His was, and by that same working power of God that raised Christ from the dead, so will our bodies be raised. But we won't be what we were. It says, we don't know what we're going to be, but we know that uh, we will be like Him. For we shall see him and, you know, with our own eyes. So, as he is, it says in 1 John. So anyway, it says that he was made a quickening spirit. But he says, how be it? That was not first, which was spiritual. And certainly not. We are natural first, spiritual second. 
You know, he was spiritual first. And then he became <laughs> then he became natural. And now, and he died that way. And now he's been raised up. Spiritual body. Verse 47. The first man is of the earth. Earthy. And we are made from the elements of this world. That's all we are. Except for the spirit, which is not part of our corporeity. It says the second man, speaking of Christ, is the Lord from heaven. As the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. So like Adam, each one of us is earthy. And as the heavenly, such are they which are heavenly. As we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. See how when he raised from the dead the first fruits of the resurrection? That is the promise of a full harvest of the people of this world being raised into a state of eternal incorruption as spiritual bodies that are human but changed to a better state, a more glorious state, a powerful state, a sinless state, an eternal state, where we'll have the, the beauty of our youth forever, because we won't change. And there'll be nothing defiling or mean in that place. Jesus speaking of that in the book of Revelation, when he speaks to John, kind of describes it partially this way. He's speaking to John, and he identifies who, who he is. And he says, uh, so when John, John says, and when I saw him, this, this person, meaning Christ, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, fear not. Which is just what the angel said. He said, be not afraid. You know, that's what he always says, fear not. Because being close to him makes us afraid. But he says, don't be. It's a good thing. Okay, so he says, fear not. I am first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, but behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. He's got control over this whole thing. I'm not going to finish him. I don't get going on. So anyway, we'll move past the angel that looked young and was in every way except by how we count years. He was no less perfect at that time than he was when God made him because he did not sin. So, uh, nor will we after we're raised from the dead. So, uh, they went out. They were amazed. They were afraid. They were fearful. They were afraid to tell anybody, but they did tell them. At least Mary did. She, she got ahead of them, saw Jesus, ran back to the apostles first. You have to read other accounts and told of the risen Lord to, the, to, to Peter and James and John. And they didn't believe her. And then it says, they did not believe what she said. Then we talk about those who had appeared to on the road to Emmaus. And it says in verse 13, and they went out and told it to the residue, I mean the rest of the disciples, neither believed they them. So if these apostles who were the closest to Christ, whom he had told he would raise on the he would raise from the dead on the third day, they still would not would believe the people that actually saw that. Why would they not believe them? Did they think that Mary was untrustworthy? Or that these disciples on the road to Emmaus were similarly untrustworthy? Why why would it enter their mind to disbelieve people that they loved and had walked with and been with for years? and taught by Christ and done wonderful things with each other, you know, as far as the propagation of the gospel in Israel and all that. I think it gets down to just human weakness and hardness of heart. Because to this very day, I can tell you all about the day that Jesus saved me. What that was, and I have done so. What that was like, you know. But because you're not me, <laughs> and you didn't have that precise you know, experience, you have no real positive reason to know it happened just like I said it. After all, I'm a fallible human being. 
You just have, you either take my word for it or you don't. Doesn't really matter. All you can do with people is tell them what the Lord has done for you, but you cannot make them believe it. If if if, if Mary Magdalene and the two disciples had seen the Lord and come to these apostles and tell them and they don't believe it, how do you expect sinners to believe you when you tell them that getting born again is a real thing, that it is definitely an occurrence between you and God, a meeting takes place in which he communicates to your heart life and eternal life at that and the forgiveness of sins, how, how in a moment of time you are changed inwardly and forever and you are caused to know that by God. Now, did he say every word I just said? No, it was in an instant, it was all revealed. It, it's just like, he just knew that it was true. It came out of nowhere. The Spirit came upon you and then like the wind, it just went somewhere else. And, and you're just sitting there saying, wow, I was begging that this would happen. And, and I, I, I began to think it never would happen. And then it happened. When I was at my rock bottom, it happened. When, when I had almost given up all hope of being forgiven and I had no right to be forgiven, He forgave me. When, when all I contemplated was death, he gave me eternal life. In just a moment, it all suddenly and completely changed me. Now my flesh is still my flesh, but inwardly I'm totally different. I'm a new creature, not what I was. And it changed my fate, my destiny. I am now predestinated to be conformed to His image that rose on that day. I will be resurrected in like manner and in a like body with a like, I don't even know if we have a separate spirit. A spiritual body seems to be one integral thing and not divided like we are here between flesh and spirit, which the Bible makes very clear there's a distinction between those. That will be gone, I think, in a spiritual body. We'll be a unity like we should have always been and would have been, but not for sin. So anyway, it goes on. It says, uh, if I get to the next place I want to talk about. So it says then in uh, verse 12, they believed them, they didn't believe them. And uh, I think it's because maybe they thought if he was going to appear to anybody first, <laughs> surely it would have been us. Now, I, could, I mean, I could be wrong. I may be appropriating to them something that's not accurate. But if I had to guess, I would guess that because to this very day, I have told family members and other people about being saved. And they say, well, do you think God's a respecter of persons? Do you think somehow God just was particularly nice to you? That, you know, beyond what he is? Because that didn't happen to me, is what they're saying. Or inferring sometimes. But sometimes they just come out and say, that never happened to me. And, and I have gone to church and I have done these good things. I never had that happen to me. And I think just what the Lord said. He says, many shall say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we not in thy name done many wonderful words? Have we not in thy name cast out devils? And he say, I never knew you. See, when you get saved, you know God. Person to person, you meet him. In a moment of time, and you're changed. Now, those people were saying, that never happened to me. But you're saying it happened to you. Why should I believe that? And I tell them, did you ever ask God for that to happen to you? Did you ever seek God in prayer and continue to pray for eternal life, forgiveness of sins, to be saved? Have you ever prayed that and continued doing it until you got an answer from God? And the answer is no. <laughs> they never did. What does the Bible say about that? He to whom uh, to whosoever knocketh the door is open. Whosoever seeketh shall find. I mean it's you got to look for it. You can't do it on your own. You can't do any of it other than desire it enough to pray to God for it. To, to recognize that you may be lost. 
If you don't know that you're saved, it's because you're lost. Because when you get saved, you know you're saved. God confirms that. His Spirit wears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. If you don't have the Spirit of God bearing witness to that, and if you don't have a recollection when you pass from death into life, chances are you're still dead and you don't even know it. Like the whole world is just about. I hope that's not true for anybody in this service. But I never know because I can't look on your heart any more than you can look on mine. We can just hear what each other says about it and take consolation if it sounds anything like what happened to us. They just couldn't believe it because it didn't happen to them. But then he appeared to them <laughs> and they believed it. Now Thomas wasn't there so he didn't believe it so he had to Appeared to Thomas again. You know, the second, well, he, he, Thomas wasn't there, so he appeared to Thomas also at a later point. And uh, of course, he had told them, Thomas did, that unless I stick my finger in the, in, the, in the holes in his hands and thrust my hand up into his side, I will not believe. So Jesus says, hey, Thomas, <laughs> stick your finger in here. Stick your hand up, his hole in my side. And be not faithless, but believing. The fact that Jesus offered that just shows the, the patience that he has with hard-hearted people, even amongst his disciples. He knows our weakness, but he upbraids it. We should not be weak, but we are. So they should not have been weak, but they were. And since he knows our frame and our a proclivity towards unbelief and, and, and a lack of belief in that which is supernatural or, or beyond rationality, the normal order of things, he, he takes pity on us and he helps us pass those failings. But he reminds us that they are failings. And then he says... Uh, Let me see what I can find here. Oh, I just had a note that these people were grieving without a doubt. You know, all that Sabbath. If we want to turn to John 16, verse 19, we have proof of it because Jesus foretold even that. So, uh, John 16 and 19, Jesus says, do ye inquire among yourselves of that I said, a little while and you shall not see me, and again a little while and you shall see me? See how much it sense it in a little while, meaning in a few hours, you know, he'd be dead. But in a little while, a few more hours, he'd be alive again. He says, uh, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament. And they did. But the world shall rejoice. Those who are under the, the, the prince of this world, Lucifer, Satan, they were happy that he was dead. He says, And ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned to joy. A woman that is, I won't read all that, but uh, basically it says, uh, verse 22, And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. He prophesied of the very coming of himself into the room where they were, which was probably the same upper room that he had gotten provision for, or rented, or whatever he did for the observance of the Passover, and after which he went to the garden, and he was betrayed, and then he was, he was tried, and then he was crucified, and then he had a restful Sabbath, and then dawned the first day of the new week, and with it, the first day of a new world. A world in which the payment for sin had been totally paid. The ransom paid in full. Redemption for any man that wants it with all his heart is available. Now, I know they were saved back then, but it was, it was based upon a promise that he would do what he did. Now he's done the thing. There's no more for him to do. It is finished, he said. And he sat down thenceforth expecting until all things come to pass according to the will of God. 
Well, to the extent that men don't fight it. Because we also read that God is not willing that any should perish. Not of one, but that all should come to repentance, meaning everyone would be saved. But he leaves that up to us. Then he just gives the commission. You know all about it. It, it applies to us. It's not just the apostles. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. That means everyone. Now, the apostles didn't preach to everyone, but all that they could. And they encouraged others to preach to others. And eventually it spread around the globe for the most part. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. It is the belief that brings salvation. The baptism there probably speaking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost, which happened right after Pentecost. But if it's speaking about water baptism, it does not say he that is not baptized is damned. If you believe, you're saved, and you will be baptized, because that's what he calls you to do. Anyway, and these signs shall follow that believe, them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, speak in new tongues, uh, take up certain serpents, and if they drink and eat, he talks about the things that can happen. And it did happen during the days of the apostles. And, and those gifts were given by the laying on of hands of the apostles. We read that the laying on of hands of anybody else had nothing to do with the conference of those gifts. That was peculiar to the time. People don't believe that today. They still believe in, in speaking in tongues. I know that God could cause any one of us to speak in tongues if he wants to. But what I've heard about it, it did not sound real to me. I've never heard it where it seemed like anything other than gibberish. I, I'm just, you know, uh, but I am available to be convinced. I'll be certainly convinced when I see them uh, healing the sick and bringing people out of the grave, like the apostles and the ones they laid hands on had the ability to do, and casting out spirits. When they do that in an unmistakable way, and they speak in tongues, even though I don't understand them, I'll be amen in them. <laughs> if they bring bodies out of the grave. Until that point, maybe not. And then it says, So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received, this is verse 19, up into heaven, he sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them. So it's always important when you go about the Lord's work that you're prayed up to the Lord that He will be in you and, and give you the utterance. Give your heart the feeling it has, whether that's bowels of compassion or, or love or whatever it is that's needed for the occasion in which you're engaging other people. You need the Lord with you. You don't have the power to do that on your own any more than these apostles. He told them, he says, without me, you can't do a thing. Nothing. I'm divine. You're the branches. You've got to remain in me or you'll be cast out. So he says, the Lord working with them. There's too little of people and of preachers in particular finding the Spirit of God confirming in their heart that he's ready for you to preach that very message to those very people and then also that preacher prays for the people that he's preaching to that, the God, that God will open up their hearts to the message as well. Because we can't do a thing profitable towards the salvation of men except God is active in every bit of it. And I'll end it with that. He closes with the word, uh, work, the Lord working with him, confirming the word with signs following. Amen. So the gospel according to Mark which many people say that it was Peter's gospel, he had Mark write it down. I don't know. I don't, there's no way to prove that. Uh, certainly Mark doesn't say it, but we know that Mark is the one who penned it. And the other is somewhat conjecture. So, word on anybody's heart at this time. And if you're on the phone, you'll have to unmute. Good message, Harvey. Thank you, Dennis.